Hello! I thought I'd take advantage of today's beautiful weather to talk about today's sermon called Walking on Sunshine. Today, Pastor Greg is going to tell us how we need to let our light shine by walking with the sun, Jesus. Let's go take a look. You can go ahead and be seated and turn in your Bibles, please, to 1 John. 1 John. Do you need a Bible? We've got a, gals, a couple of gals that will bring you a Bible if you need one today. Anybody leave home without a Bible and need a loaner copy? Anybody? Look at that. Everybody brought their, uh, everybody brought their Bibles. How cool is that? All right, let's do this. Repeat after me. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, or at, let's back this up. If we walk in the light as God is in the light, <laughs> We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Okay, let's do that one more time. But if we walk in the light as God is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses, oh, but the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Let's pray. Father, uh, we want to walk in sunshine. You say if we walk in the light as you, God, are in the light, we'll have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. God, this morning, let it be our anthem, let it be our commitment to you that we will not be satisfied in walking in darkness and our goal will be every day to walk in your sunshine, S-O-N. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you, John, for uh, doing that. So uh, last week, last week, in uh, our adventure in 1 John, we zeroed in on the first five reasons. The first five reasons that uh, John gives us for writing this particular epistle. And he said, I have written you these things, so what? That your what? That your joy may be full. Now, even though we... Uh, we have access. Do you know that right now, right now, point at the grumpy person next to you. No, don't do that. But uh, right now, we have access to abundant life. Abundant life. The joy of the Lord is our strength. But does that describe you? Does that describe you this morning? I know that it usually describes me, but sometimes, sometimes we allow the smallest of circumstances to steal our joy, as in the case of what I talked about last week, as in the case of uh, getting stuck behind a uh, sandwich boy at Subway while he ordered seven sandwiches. Seven, that's like standing behind seven, waiting in line behind another seven people, and uh, I could have been happy. I'm still going to get my foot-long onion teriyaki <laughs> chicken sandwich. I, I, but I didn't. I, I, I could have stayed happy, but I chose to get all sappy, you know, about it instead. But apparently, joylessness is going around in, uh, in fast food restaurants these days. I don't know if you heard about this. There's a guy, there's a guy that sues a fast food restaurant <laughs> claiming that this restaurant is the reason that he can't get happy. Did you hear about this? This restaurant is the reason why he can't, why he can't get happy. Last year, a man in Tennessee goes to his local Popeye's, Louisiana kitchen restaurant to get one of their new what? Crispy chicken sandwich. And they're good, right? Have you had one of those? Yeah, they're actually pretty good. They're actually pretty good. But, uh, but they're all out. So he drives to another Popeye's, and they're sold out too. And he goes to two more Popeye's restaurants, and they're out as well. 
gets very, very disappointed, chalks it up to, well, bummer, I guess that's just how the burger crumbles or however that goes. Well, that's what he should have done. In reality, he sues Popeyes for $5,000. He sues Popeyes for $5,000. He claims emotional distress, and then he claims uh, wear and tear on his vehicle from having to drive around to, uh, to all the different restaurants. And, and uh, he's quoted as saying this. He's quoted as saying, I can't get happy. I have this sandwich on my mind. I can't think straight. It just consumes you. Now, being a dude, I understand how my mind can sometimes get a little consumed over food. Guys, can I get men? Amen. And girls? And ladies, right? Right? But letting a $3.99 chicken sandwich from Popeye's ruin my day, not going to happen. It's not, it's not going to happen. Now, maybe if we were talking about like a, like a Hardee's, you know, monster burger right there, but not a chicken sandwich from Popeye's. 1,400 calories right there, 1,400 calories. Now, here's the deal. We might laugh at that. We might laugh at that, thinking this guy's a knucklehead, which he is, which he, which he is. But, 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 have you ever been a knucklehead or a knucklehead at and allowed your joy to get stolen? Did you throw your joy away over something very, very minor. Raise your hand if you've ever done that. Okay, all of us. All of us have. Oh, how things look so much differently when the sandwich is on the other plate, right? My encouragement, do not allow anyone or anything to steal your joy, that our joy may be what? May be full. Now, we open chapter 1 with the Apostle John giving us uh, his credentials and that he was an eyewitness. He was an eyewitness to the Lord and then we can trust his testimony. He then addresses the issue of joy, Holy Spirit anointed joy that has its roots in the fact that we have peace with God through our relationship with Jesus and that that, that should be reflected, that should be reflected in the fact, remember we showed part of this song last week, Oh Happy Day, the day that our sins were what? Washed away. When you're tempted to go into a funk about something, this is what I think about. I think about the day that I knew nothing except I was once lost and now I'm found. I was blind, and now I see. And, and, and the joy of knowing that my name is written in the Lamb's book of life, that my sins have been separated as far as east from west. How can you have a crummy day? How can you have a crummy sourpuss look on your face? I'm looking right now at all the sourpuss people, okay? There aren't any because you're all happy. But how could you ever have a sourpuss look on your face when you have the living God dwelling in your heart? It's because we forget, Right? It's because we forget who is living in our hearts. Now, on this topic of our sins being washed away, when we get to verse 9 in our study for this morning, John is going to proclaim the exhilarating promise that if we confess our sin, what? God will forgive us. God will forgive us our sin. But we're going to start, we're going to start and pick things up here in, uh, in verse 5. Look at this. Read it with me. This is the message which we have heard from God and declare to you that God is light and in him what? Is some darkness? No, is no darkness at all. And, and, and John uses the Greek word. It's a Greek word, phos, phos, or, or phos. And, and uh, it means to shine or to, to make manifest. He's using it as a, uh, as a contrast. Have you, have you ever seen phosphorus? Phosphorus, have you ever seen phosphorus burn? Okay, how many ex-pyros, right? Like to light stuff on fire and blow stuff up, anybody? Okay, what's the statute of limitations? I know you're thinking about that, okay. What did I light on fire that I never got caught for, right? I used to love to watch stuff burn back in the day, you know. It was bad, but some of you did as well, but, but 
phos. You know, it's a contrast to darkness. Uh, darkness and light are opposites. There's your contrast. So, if, uh, if we turned all the lights off in here, some of you would go, oh, right? <laughs> We've been in the dark before, right? It's not a big deal, but some of you just have to, oh, about anything. There's a dead squirrel in the road. <gasps> oh, right? Big deal. Some people just, that's just how they respond. But you would have a greater contrast to see the difference between light and darkness. And 1 Timothy 6.16 says that God dwells. God dwells in unapproachable light. In 1 Peter 2, verse 9 it tells us that God has called us out of darkness into what? Into his glorious light. Jesus calls us sons of light in Luke 16, 8, and the light of the world in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. In a couple of verses, John is going to tell us that it's when we walk in the light of God's precepts, it is then and only then that we can have fellowship with God. Just as darkness cannot exist in the presence of light, sin cannot exist in the presence of a holy God. This is why our sin needs to be forgiven for a person to go to heaven, because God cannot allow sin in his presence. If he allowed one person with one sin into heaven, would it still be perfect? No. No, of course not. Of course not. God is completely holy. Man is completely unholy outside of regeneration in him. Man is desperately, eternally lost without Jesus, the light of the world, indwelling us as a result of choosing to turn to Jesus. Now remember, it's a two-step process. When we turn to Jesus, we are also saying that we will turn from sin, right? But you can't turn from sin without him. We've all tried. Amen. People go through the 10-step or 12-step or 25-step program, and eventually it fails. There's a one-step program. Receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and sin will no longer have dominion, right, over you, according to Romans, Romans 6. That's the package deal of a relationship with God. Turn to Jesus and turn what? From, from sin. Now, concerning sin, in these next five verses, John is going to give us some statements that are, they're going to be like spiritual shock treatment, and each of them begin with, with these if statements. So just circle every time you see an if. Because if it's if, if there's an if there, what does it tell you? It's conditional. It's conditional on whatever the rule there is being set up. Look at verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with God and walk in darkness, we what? We tell a little itty bitty fibby, right? And do not practice. No, we lie. How many of you like being called a liar? I can't stand it because I go to great lengths not to lie. How many of you have ever been called a liar? And you weren't a liar. Let me see. How many of you have ever been called a liar because you were a liar? All right. The rest of you have never lied and gotten caught. Busted. How many of you have ever been a child? Okay. Then you have gotten caught lying. And believe me, we get caught lying now as well. I love this because John is no longer known as the younger brother of the, uh, of the sons of thunder. Remember, how old is John here? How old do we think that John is? He's about 60 years old, right? And we were, 19, this is like 90, 95 AD. So John was probably late 20s maybe, late 20s, when he, was following, when he was following the Lord. Maybe 30, maybe, maybe 30. So he has 60 years 
60 years under his belt of following Christ, do you think that he has earned the right to be able to speak truth in love? Of course, of course. When you get older, I know there's no old people here, but when you get older, one thing I have noticed is that you just get tired of the nonsense of always having to couch every little thing that you say and you have to worry about everybody's little feelings. Feelings, yeah. All your little feelings getting hurt. At some point in your life said, no, I'm just going to talk to you man to man. Adult to adult. Don't be hiding under the same excuses that we had when we were 10. We got to grow up, right? Don't we have to grow up, accept personal responsibility? It says, I'm a man. When I became a man, I put away what? Childish things, right? Once spoke like a, a, a child. I acted as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. That's why as a leader, I, just, I, I can't put up with it. That makes me an enabler. I'll be gracious until it becomes a pattern. But if it's something that continues, then it has to be addressed. And John is that way. He's not concerned about hurting anybody's feelings. He's concerned about their walks with the Lord. What are you more concerned about with people? What are you more concerned about with your children? Your family members, your friends, more concerned about their feelings or their faith in Christ? Let me tell you, be more concerned about their faith in Jesus. But he used to be one of the sons of thunder, but now he's exercising grace and has become known as a man of compassion and love. Yet saying that, his boldness has not waned in the slightest. Clearly stating here that if, 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 if we claim to love God, but perpetually walk in sin, what? We lie, lie, lie like a rug, right? Lie like a rug. You young people ask somebody older. They'll, they'll explain that one. They'll explain that one to you. Eight times. Eight times. In these five chapters, John is going to call out the lie of those who claim to know Christ. But John is going to say boldly. Remember, he's speaking to the church. He's going to boldly say that you are not a believer. You are a make-believer. You are pretending to know Christ. Now, I am not a, uh, a fan of the message translation of the Bible, but I like the way that it reads in this particular verse. Read it with me. What's it say? If we claim that we experience a shared life with God and continue to stumble around in the dark, we're obviously what? Lying through our teeth. We're not living what we claim. John is saying that there were people then in the church, like there are people now in the church, who claim to be walking in the light. But we're walking in darkness, reminding us it's not what we say that reveals that, uh, who we are in Christ. It's, it's, it's what we do, if we truly have a relationship with God or not. The modern church today, it just needs to get very, very honest. It needs to be honest about who is saved and who isn't. The Bible is very clear about who is saved. Now, here's the deal. Aren't you glad that you don't have to make that ultimate call? But how many of you are able to observe somebody else's fruit and get a pretty good idea where they stand, where they stand with the Lord? It's not going to be a comfortable chat standing before the Lord for those people that defend that just because someone said they were a Christian meant they were. Because that is the exact opposite of what John just told us. Next, we get some uh, incredibly good news uh, about our sin being cleansed. Look at this, verse, uh, verse 7. Now, it is going to be a memory verse, so maybe you want to write this one down or, or start to hide it in your heart. Now, if, if, right? Did you circle that? If, if we walk in the light, as God is in the light, we have what? Fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ is... Son cleanses us from, from all sin. What's all mean? 
I like that. Did you circle the word F? Did you circle the word F? Once again, John makes a, does that make it a conditional or an unconditional statement? Conditional, conditional. right. Obviously, it's conditional. If you do this, the result will be this. Also, did you notice that this is the third time in seven verses that John mentions fellowship. Fellowship. Fellowship with God equals intimacy with God. Do you have intimacy with God? Now, most of you are going to say, yes, of course. We're in a church today. We're all professing Christians. Of course, I have intimacy with God. Intimacy with God. Intimacy, familiarity, closeness, affection, love. Does that describe your connection to the Savior? Because if it does, you're not going to continue to sin. You can't. Because every time you sin, what does it do? When you when I sin, okay, when I sin, because you guys never sin. When I sin, usually I'm pretty sensitive to the Holy Spirit telling me right away. And I get pretty remorseful because I realize that I have just hurt the heart of God. I have hurt the heart of my God that hung on a cross for me. And I'm going, what am I doing? Lord, and what am, I've told you this before, one of, my, one of my prayers almost daily is, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. <laughs> because sometimes during that day, guess what? I'm going to sin somewhere in my thought life. Don't give me that pious look because you all do as, uh, as well. How strong is your love connection with the Lord this morning? Because if you're walking in the light, if you're walking in the light, it's going to be very strong. Walking in the light as God is in the light, means we are mimicking His attributes. Let me ask you this. Do you think God is moody? Do you think God is moody? Do you think God pouts? Do you? Do you pout? Do you get moody? Do you? It's like we have the spirit of the living God dwelling in us. So how hard do we have to work to be moody. You really have to work very, very hard. It means that you have to forget, at least temporarily, all the promises of God. All of them. All of them. You know what I'm saying here, right? So I'm encouraging you. God promises abundant life. An abundant life does not include moodiness. Walking in light as God is in light means we are mimicking His attributes. Holiness is one. Purity is our goal. Abiding in His Word, following His precepts to the T. That's the goal. No, no editing, no blame shifting, no excuse giving, no reasoning away that doesn't apply to you. To a T is what our goal is. Now, we don't always live to that, but that should be our goal. With the Scriptures being the absolute authority for our lives. That's what BCF was all about. Because then we can be assured that the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, does what? What did we just read? Cleanses us from, from all sin. Now, to give you a visual aid of what happens when we walk in darkness, once again, I will throw myself under the bus. Because my, my life is one big sermon illustration. Sometimes there's good things. A whole bunch of times there are, there are, uh, are, are less than good things. Um, but it makes for good sermon fodder. So I've got a one-minute video for you to get an idea All right, of so walking I in the light. I am going to lock everything up. It's about 9 o'clock. And I know that I have to turn the propane tank off that's in the back of the church that's keeping everything heated back there so our pipes don't freeze. And Looks a little dark. I'm too cheap to turn the hall light on because I'm trying to be a good steward of I'm God's still resources. Looking at my phone, and then all of a sudden, bam, bam. That's my melon. See those marks right there? Those smudge marks? Yeah, that's my that's face. That's my face. Because I was looking down. 
instead of looking up and I was walking in the dark and not walking in the light like I was supposed to be doing. So live and learn. I hope you appreciate all the work I went to to give you that little illustration. One of the things that you have to, this is a sign of maturity when you can laugh at yourself. Can you laugh at yourself? Can you? Would you put a video like that of some knucklehead thing that you did for the whole world to see? Well, guess what? God sees it all. Anyway, now, um, I have never been accused of being the crunchiest Dorito in the bag, you know? Uh, if I wouldn't have been such a penny pincher, it's Mark's fault, actually. Uh, if I wouldn't have been such a penny pincher, I would have turned the lights on and not ended up with a crunched up nose. And I had a knot. I had a knot over my eye as a result. I don't know why you think that's funny, but here's the kicker. The reason I wasn't looking ahead is because I was looking at my phone. I was looking at my phone. What was I doing on my phone? No, I wasn't texting. No, I wasn't checking email. No, I wasn't making a call. I was trying to find my phone's flashlight. <laughs> I was trying to find my, my phone's flashlight. And Bam! <laughs> Hit the mirror. Hmm. If I would have been walking in the light, I would have had this problem. What a great principle the Lord gives us in Ephesians. This is Ephesians chapter 5. For you were once in darkness, but now you are what? In the light, in the light of the Lord. Walk as children of the light. I say the same thing to you this morning. Walk as children of the light. If you profess to be a Christian, <clears throat> walk as children of the light. Also, did you spot the conditional promise there? That if we are walking in the light, we're going to have fellowship with one another. We're going to have fellowship with one another. We are missing out on a great blessing when we don't experience great fellowship and friendship with the brethren. I don't know how many weeks it's been since Andy's been here, but I miss my fellowship. Don't you miss your fellowship with Andy? Yeah. I'm saying this because he's watching from Memphis right now, so I have to, you know. And Pam and Brian uh, are watching from, those are Ellen's parents, by the way, are watching. And I, I, just, I just miss his fellowship because he's another guy that just loves the Lord. He loves the Word. And he loves you. So there's an instant, there's an instant bond a fellowship there. But I have been watching the body of Christ. I've been a Christian for 30 years now. I've been watching the body of Christ. And it's obvious that when we are not in good fellowship with God's people, it's a sign we are not in good fellowship with God. Amen. How can you say that you love God and not love God's people? That's exactly what John is going to say when we get to chapter 4, verse 20, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he say that he loves God who he has not seen? If we love God, we will love God's children. And here's the other kicker, we will want to be around them. We will want to be around them because we are starved. For we get dirty out there in the world, right? We get dirty out in the world. <laughs> And we need to come together in fellowship. And there's just like a mutual cleansing that goes on. Eleven times, eleven times in chapters 3 and 4, John is going to remind us that loving one another is not an option. It's actually a, starts with a C, ends in O-man, right? Command, right? Command. We should enjoy doing life together. Now, don't base all your theology on, on rock and roll theology, but some of it has its roots in truth. Back in the day, you should listen to Prince. Any, any ex-Prince fans there? Well, in one of his songs, he said, Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to do this thing called life. A little let's go crazy flashback from 1980-something back there. God intended for his followers to do this thing called life together, together. And one doing life together event that I enjoy uh, 
participating in is taking people to see Calvary Big Church Fellowship. Most of you only know Calvary Chapel from this little tiny church in Rapid City, South Dakota. So I love to take uh, people to our leadership conferences, and I, uh, I did that. Um, I don't know, I've done it a bunch of times, but I think it was back in, uh, in 2017. 2017, I took, I took Aaron and Justin and Ryan. We went out to California uh, for a few days to a conference. And, uh, let, well, let's see. Might want to hit the lights on that. There we go. Okay. These are all leaders. This is a sanctuary that probably holds 2,500 people. These are, all, these are all leaders. This is at Raul Reese's. These are at Raul Reese's church. And these are people that take time off from work oh, to go and get trained on how to be better, better leaders. Amazing, huh? That people will give of their time and their resources to actually get trained. And, and these people really aren't green. It's just lighting that's over here. Okay. All right. Just wanted to let you know. Okay. There's a couple of our boys up there doing some work with the Lord. It's very good. So then we went, uh, this was at his church, Raul Reese's church. Okay, and, uh, oh, <laughs> don't ask. All right, and we have a lot of time. We have food. We have fellowship. Well, well, those guys are eating. I'm witnessing to the people, you know, that are all around because that's what we should be doing. Wherever we go, we should be telling people about, uh, telling people about, oh, and there's more eating. Yeah, Ryan. Yeah. And then, and then we had an opportunity to pray, pray for this girl at In-N-Out. So go to In-N-Out and pray with somebody. That's, what you should, that's your goal. All right. And then I, uh, and then I drove them down to, uh, to Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, where all these Calvary chapels began about 50 years ago. And, and uh, there were some interesting bonding moments uh, <laughs> there. You can talk to uh, Justin and Ryan afterwards and ask them exactly what was going on. And, and, uh, and then I drove them down. And then I drove them down to, to Corona Del Mar to uh, kind of Newport Beach area. We did a uh, shout out that's just in filming uh, um, a shout out. And, and it's here at Pirate's Cove where back in the day, there were ba- that's a baptism. There are baptisms of like 500 people at a time. 500 people are getting baptized at a time, and it was just, uh, you know, I, I wasn't a Christian then. Maybe some of you were, and you knew about the Jesus movement that, uh, that this was birthed out of. And, and there's uh, Ryan, you know, scaling. I, I can't remember how, how far up he is, but he was quite a ways up. Well, no, he wasn't really very far at all. He was, he was, he was barely off the sand, but, you know, it's all about, it's all about, uh, it's all about the camera angle. But I... Uh, I have those pictures. I think I have. I think All some, right. Another Just bonding moment. for a moment before we start. Ryan, tell me what's going on here. Well, I've got this burden on my shoulders. You got a burden on your shoulders? I've been carrying this burden for about three days now. <laughs> <laughs> you guys look very comfortable, very normal. Uh, uh, I, I, I say that you, when we go back, this newfound friendship that you have, let it be revealed to everybody. And don't, uh, don't be ashamed. We're not going to judge you. All right. Okay. All right. That's hilarious right there. That's hilarious right there. You know, it just, it just blesses me to see, uh, to see our guys hanging out and, uh, and having fun together. It's fun for me to see you guys doing the same thing. And, and part of that is carrying one another's burdens and experiencing fellowship through friendship. Fellowship through friendship. It blesses God when he sees his children walking together in unity. God never intended for there to be lone rangers in the body of Christ. And, and never forget this, even the lone ranger had, had Tonto, right? He even had Tonto. Who's your Tonto? Who's your Tonto? Who's your lone ranger? Who's your spiritual wingman or your spiritual wing woman? I bet you most... Most of you probably don't even have one who's really a spiritual wing woman or a spiritual wingman, the person that you can be completely honest with. And it needs to be somebody besides your spouse. Because guess what? Your spouse is a little tainted. 
She is because she's going to love you or he's going to love you no matter what. Why? Because you sleep in the same bed. You need somebody who's not going to show favoritism and partiality on anything. Somebody who will speak the truth and uh, love to you. Because believe me, I've talked to many of your wives, and your wives have realized sometimes I just got to go to my prayer closet and, uh, and not keep bringing this kind of stuff up because my husband is not picking up what I'm laying down. Ladies, you don't have to agree, I, but I know that you do because you've told me you do. So even in our church, I can see that, that we can be in fellowship. We can be in fellowship with many, but close to few but close to few. And you need to find a few people in your life that you, that you can be close to. Thus, the ever tiresome, believe me, I see your mugs every time I say something like, like, hey, nobody sits alone, right? Or, hey, can you all scooch you into the middle aisle or something like that? Or, uh, or how many people, how many, how, uh, you guys are on your way out and go, hey, did you meet anybody new today? Have I ever said any something like that to you as you're exiting? Yeah, I do that because I know that you get tired of it, but God doesn't get tired of it. And I'm going to say it until you understand the wisdom in it, until you make it your own, because it's biblical, doing this life, this thing called life together. Godly fellowship. Under, under the banner of God's authority brings a supernatural comfort to the body of Christ through walking the light as Jesus is in the light. And in reality, church, church should be a holy convocation, an assembly of believers walking in the light, walking in the light as Jesus is in the light. Now, in, uh, in verses 8 through 10, what, verse 9, I bet you have up on a plaque on your wall, or maybe you've memorized that somewhere, but I bet, I bet you don't have the verse before it and the verse after that. So verse 9 is the grace sandwich between verses 8 and 10. So, uh, so look there at those two verses. We're going to look at those two verses, and then I'm going to come back, and I'll end up closing with, uh, with verse 9. It says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If you have never underlined deceive ourselves, I encourage you to do it now. We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him, God, a liar and his word is not in us. Remember who these epistles are written to. Believers 2,000 years ago, just like today, the church was full of people who fell into the category of believing deceiving, right? Or deceiving believing. They were professing believers, not possessing believers. Have you ever convinced yourself that what you're doing wasn't sin when God clearly says it was? I have. I have, of course. But how does that happen? It happens when our walking in the light gets muddled. Gets muddled. And what we think is slightly non-light is in reality full-blown darkness. And our spiritual eyes become dimmed and our spiritual noses can no longer discern between the aroma of Christ and the aroma of the world. Now, speaking of, uh, of aroma of the world, this last Sunday, this last Sunday after you guys all, we got done with our, with our video, I had like 30 minutes ago, over and grab something to eat, and then I went over to Open Bible where they had the uh, memorial for uh, Roe v. Wade that was actually on Wednesday of this week down at Open, our friends at, uh, at Open Bible. And then I went and I sat, uh, because they have upward basketball in Sunday afternoons, so uh, I went to Open Bible and I was sitting after that, I went to the bleachers and I was talking to Holly, Holly Kaufman. Uh, about this outreach that we want to do for law enforcement wives. And, and up strolls Aaron with their toddler, Jalissa, who uh, immediately gives me a big hug, which was great. But during said hug, I smell the unmistakable, pungent aroma of a poopy diaper. 
That is unmistakable. Well, well, Aaron, Aaron, this is not, it just, it was great. Aaron says, well, it's fine. I don't smell anything. I don't, I don't smell anything. And then Holly, and Holly being the mom that she is, she does the pull and peer maneuver. You know what the pull and peer maneuver is where you, you got to <laughs> pull, stretch it out. You know what I mean? You know what exactly what I'm doing. You pull and peer maneuver, look in there, and, and uh, she immediately verified that the once new diaper was no longer, was no longer new. Now, as parents of little kids, your sense of smell has to get a little bit immune, right? Has to get a little bit immune to the uh, aroma of the world, let's just call it. The aroma of the world seeping out of your little toddler's pantalones, right? But to those of us who aren't accustomed to that uh, special fragrance, special fragrance, their sniffers, you know, are a little more sensitive, and we pick up on it immediately. Here's the application. Here's the application. Just because we don't smell it doesn't mean it doesn't smell. Just because you don't smell your own sin doesn't mean it doesn't smell to everybody who's around you who can obviously see it. I want to let that sink in for a minute because this morning we're preparing our hearts to partake of <laughs> communion. And all these little instances that you blow off, we blow off, I blow off all the time, of, way well, this really isn't sin. It is sin to God. And we can't have fellowship. We can't walk in the light as He is in the light. And we certainly can't partake of communion if we're justifying all our little sins. So just be thinking about that as we prepare our hearts for communion here in just a few moments. Just because we don't acknowledge our sin doesn't mean the sin isn't there. And John says that when we do that, we deceive ourselves. We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. It's a dangerous place to be, right? It's a dangerous, dangerous, dangerous place to be. And to... Uh, we can falsely convince ourselves that we are walking in the light, but if there's ongoing sin in our life, it doesn't matter what we convince ourselves of. God says it's sin, and not to admit it, confess it, and turn from that sin, like I said, is a spiritually dangerous position to put yourself in. You're putting yourself in that. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. I want you to have this highlighted in your Bibles. Underline. It's a dangerous place because the epitome of the deceived person is found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of the Father in heaven. Verse 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then Jesus says, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice. Highlight, circle that word, practice lawlessness. Jesus isn't talking about the person who sins on a certain occasion and is quick to repent of their sin. Jesus isn't talking about those few and far between situations because we all sin in some capacity Every day, because sin is anything that we think, say, or do that is displeasing to God. So we, we sin in our thought life every day. How many of you drove to church today? Chances are, when you're behind the wheel of a car, you are tempted, at least tempted to sin. Rapid City has crummy drivers. I just got to say that. It's got crummy drivers. This, this, whole, this is why King David said... Not that they're crummy drivers, because he didn't know that there were going to be crummy drivers, okay? But this is why King David said in Psalm 19, 14, let the, say it with me. What's it say? Let the words of my mouth and the meditation, right? The meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. What goes on in our heart is going to what? Come out of our mouth and come out in our behavior, so it's not the rare incident John is talking about here. It's the ongoing practice, the unrepented of practice. It is the convincing of ourselves that God is not offended 
by what we have done or by what we are about to do. You know, I know, if you have the Holy Spirit, he's telling you. Paul gives a very short list of self-deceived sin that can prevent people from going to heaven. Look at this. Again, turn your own Bibles. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Somebody here needs to take this very seriously this morning. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And here it is again. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. But look at the, look at the promise of verse 11. But such were, underline every time you, you, you see were, but such were some of you, because that's past tense. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord and by the Spirit of our God. The good news is found there in verse 11. God can cleanse any sinful vice or behavior or lifestyle or habit with his mercy, grace, and forgiveness. Lying, right? Stealing, coveting, drunking, gossiping. That's what revilers mean. I mean it, it, being a gossip is a big deal to God. Slander, be, it's a big deal to God. Idling, and there are some more of the, uh, the obvious things. Look there in verse 9. Maybe, ver yeah, verse 9. Look at what it says. It says what? Fornicating, adultering, homosexualing, sodomiting, you know, the, the body of Christ needs to stop deceiving itself. God says that if a person is sexually active outside of marriage, God calls that what? Starts on an F, ends in ornication, uh, <laughs> Californication, right? Some of us grew up there. It was the, the sin du jour. And there's no assurance that that person will inherit the kingdom of God. And just a few verses later, look in your Bibles, look at verse 18. Look at verse 18, Paul says, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against what? What's it say? Sins against his own body. We have similar statements in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3, and Colossians 3, verse 5. Sexual sin is serious to God, and like all sin, we harden ourselves to it every time we do not immediately accept personal responsibility for it. Regardless of the sin, never forget, it's the deceiver's job. It is the deceiver's job to deceive you into not knowing that you have been deceived. There's lots of people that have looked at me and said, well, Greg, I have a piece about this, or, or you know, I don't feel convicted about this. I'm going, man. You have hardened your heart to the Holy Spirit's conviction, and it's a very, very dangerous to, place to be. All right, let's wrap up and prepare our hearts for communion with a great news. There's an antidote. You, get, you guys ready for the antidote of sin? It's found right there in verse, uh, verse 9. Read it with me. If we confess our sin, what? God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Woohoo! Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. This is one of the first verses that I memorized 30 years ago because I understood just how in need I am of God's forgiveness. I confessed my sin. I confessed my sin to God on August 27th, 1989. And I confess my sins just about every day since. The primary confession of sin takes place the moment that we admit our need for Jesus, where we become, where we allow Jesus to become the propitiation for our sin, the covering for our sin. We become born again, and we were birthed immediately at that moment into the family of God. Positionally, we are justified, and our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And with that said, it is completely evident that Christians still sin. Do you realize, do you ever think about how often every day, even as a believer, 
We still sin. It happens because we're not practicing the presence of God. My driving habits are different when I realize Jesus is in that car with me. Right? My mouth, usually, no, always when I'm practicing the presence of God, it's when I'm not practicing the presence of God that I say things that I shouldn't say. You guys can relate to that? Anybody? Just me? All right. Okay. Just me? Okay. Here's the deal. God sees every time we sin, and he expects us to confess our sin as soon as the Holy Spirit convicts us, which is at the moment that we do sin. It's only when we harden our hearts that we deceive ourselves that we, that we get numb to that kind of stuff. We hear all kinds of, well, how many of you have a Fitbit or something like that? Something else that records how many steps you have in your heart rate? What else? What else do you have on that? Heart rates? Sleep. Sleep. All that kind of stuff. How many miles? Does it do the miles and how far you walked and how many steps that, uh, that you took? Well, what, what, if there, what, what if there was a sinometer <laughs> that, was, that was built in? Yeah, I don't want that option. I don't want that. No, don't tell... Apple would know a little something about sin, right? Okay, okay. I don't want that option on my, uh, option on my Fitbit, right? That counted how many sins we do a day. I think we would really, I think we would honestly be amazed by the number. But here's the deal. Sinning doesn't make me a sinner. It just proves that I am a sinner, right? All of sin and fall short of the glory of God. But here's the deal. A sinner saved by grace, but one who still sins. And here's the deal. It breaks our fellowship with God. If you have a genuine relationship with the Lord, nothing can break your relationship with God, but our sin can destroy our fellowship with God. That's why we read this in Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2, but your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. So my encouragement always is going to be to you, let the truth set us free, which leads to this, this final il illustration for this morning. On a Sunday morning, a pastor is, is, is focused on forgiveness, God's forgiveness, and how when we repent, he separates our sin as far as east is from west. And after the service, a woman, a woman came up to the pastor in tears saying she accepted Christ at the invitation but added that she can't believe that God would forgive her for all the horrible things that she had done in her life. And the pastor assured her that if her commitment was genuine, that all those previous sins had been forgiven. And he promised that he would seek the Lord about it. Well, the following week, the next Sunday, she shows up and asks the pastor, he, she asked the pastor, did you talk? Did you talk to the Lord? Did you talk to the Lord about my sin, my specific sins? And the pastor said, yes, I did talk to the Lord about you. And when I asked him about your specific sins from the past, God simply said, I forgot. I forgot. Now, God can't forget. He's omniscient. But from a practical perspective, that's the effect when we repent, when we turn from our sin. It's covered. It's atoned for by the blood of Jesus Christ. One of the greatest tools the devil uses against us is our shame and our guilt of sin, not letting go of what God has already let go of, what he has already atoned for. John will even tell us, when we get to chapter 3, he says in John chapter 3, verse 20, for if our heart, right, condemns us, God is greater than our hearts. Where our sin has been great, God's forgiveness can be even greater. Do you understand that? It takes honesty. It takes honesty in the in the heart. We have to trust in God's great mercy and grace and forgiveness regardless of how we feel. 
We've got to stop this feeling thing and being dictated by our emotions and dictated by your feelings. Because guess what? Most of the times, our feelings are contradictory to what the Word of God tells us. Amen. Never forget there's a major contrast between God and the devil. Here it is. The devil knows our name but calls us by our sin. And God knows our sin but calls us by our name. Ooh, that somebody should be taking a picture. Well, let me get a couple more out of there, right? I'll get a couple more on here. Take a picture of that and post those tomorrow. Hmm. Knowing this unbelievable grace of God, I, I agree with, uh, with a famous pastor, Alan Ridpath, who said, God's deterrence, right there, you know, God's forgiveness. Read it with me. God's forgiveness is a great... <laughs> deterrent to continued sin. See, it's God's mercy to forgive that it motivates me to not give him stuff necessitating him to forgive. That, that'll, that'll change your whole perspective if you start thinking that way. On this topic of forgiveness, we can never forget that there is no one beyond the point of no return that cannot be forgiven by Jesus. But you have to turn to him. The worst thing that can happen in any church service, pastors discuss this all the time, is that when people will come to a, to a church service with no intention of applying what they learned. And sometimes we end up carrying the same baggage, the same hurt, the same wound, the same sin into the service and carry that same thing out. Never forget this. Every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. That's the picture you should take, right? Every saint has a past. Aren't you thankful <laughs> that your past has been forgiven? Amen, amen. And every sinner has a future. That's the power. Lord, we thank you this morning for your long suffering and for your patience and for your grace and your compassion and your mercy and your kindness to your children. And God, we, uh, we do not want to take that for granted. We never want to take it for granted ever again. Pray, Lord, that you would make us very sensitive to sin. I pray that it wouldn't just be a memory verse for March, but that we would actually do our best to walk in the light as Jesus is in the light. Have fellowship with one another because the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all, all, all sin, separated as far as east is from west. Let that be our mantra, God, and Lord, help us to constantly be asking you, Lord, am I deceived? Am I deceiving myself in some area of my life? Lord, I give you permission to help me never be deceived again. And Lord, help me to be quick to think of 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, God is just faithful and just to cleanse us from all our sin. Let that be our banner. Let that be our marching orders this morning as a result of being cleansed of our sin to walk in the light as you, Lord, are in the light. Amen. Wow, today's sermon was enlightening. <laughs> <laughs> What are some takeaways you guys had from today's message? What goes on inside our heart is really important because it'll come out in our actions and in our words. So we need to make sure that mm -hmm. the light of God is in our heart fully. Mm -hmm. Can I have that bright and happy smile? Uh, for me, I'd say it was when Greg said, for where our sins have been great, his forgiveness is greater because that's something that the devil trips us up on quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. 
Well, thank you so much for watching today's sermon. And would you allow us to brighten up your lives by hitting the subscribe button and dinging the little bell. And we'll let you know when more sermons are available. Have a great day. Thank you.